The history of mining in Brazil begins in the colonial town of Ouro Preto, now designated a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. The amount of wealth extracted from the mines here was sufficient for constructing hundreds of exquisite homes and monuments, and more than a dozen extravagant churches. Most of the gold left the country, but some of it can still be found inside the churches here. Most of the veins of gold that made Oro Preto rich have been exhausted, but some of the mines in the hills that surround the town are still accessible to visitors today. Gold was first discovered in the state of Minas Gerais in the early 18th century. At first, it was merely placer gold on top of the ground. A hundred years later, gold was discovered down there and underground mining began with a vengeance. The mine is not just a little hole. It's 300 meters long. That's about 1,000 feet. And it's almost 400 feet deep. That's a lot of area to mine, and it was worth it. The mine closed in 1985. In the years it was open, they extracted 35 tons. The equipment used here is still the same as was used when it was an active mine. In some places the reinforcements are there, and the rest of it, the rock is competent enough, I hope, to hold up as long as I'm in here. The mine is about 400 feet deep. It's about 1,000 feet long, which is big enough to be a good-sized gold mine. A cada tonelada de rocha beneficiada, eles extraíram a faixa de 4 a 8 gramas de ouro. Uma boa parte do ouro, o quinto era para Portugal, né? Por causa da concessão, e o restante ia para as matrizes, né? Alemanha, Inglaterra, França. Sendo que só no final ficou um pouco retido aqui do Brasil. O ouro, quando ele foi encontrado no Rio, ele tinha um aspecto um pouco escuro devido ao bismuto e ao dióxido de ferro. Assim ficando negra a pedra. Só que ali também continha ouro. Por isso que eles deram o nome de ouro é, para a Isso. Gold-bearing quartz is the dream of every gold prospector. When you find a little bit of gold in quartz, it often means there's a lot more to be found. In this sort of mine, the tunnels are not made to find the vein. The tunnels are the vein. As the vein is removed, the tunnels are created. In 30 kilometers of vein in this mine, a lot of gold was removed. The official length of the mine is only 1,000 feet or so. But if you count all of the side tunnels, there are over 30 kilometers of actual tunnels. It's a long way. The lowest point of the mine today in this area a lake has formed. This is very clear water, and it's very warm water. You do not want to drink it. The concentration of metals that have leached through and concentrated here would be enough to make a chemical soup that would make you very unhappy. But looking at it, it's as though it's an underground lake in a natural cave. The development of this mine incorporated, eventually, the most modern technology in the world. If you look around, it does not strike you as being the typically dangerous place that gold mines were. The British and Germans, who were big investors in this mine, made sure they had the best technology available. 
They knew that this was a huge source of gold and immense profits would make any investment worth the money. The local availability of shale made ideal conditions for shoring up the edges of the mine. The workers were expert, they brought in the rock, placed it in here, and thus increasing the safety and productivity of the mine. The average life expectancy of a garampero or miner after they began working in the mine was eight to ten years. Miners have long believed and believe very strongly here that women, priests, and images should not be allowed in the mine. There was a practical basis for that. The miners were checked very carefully when they reached the surface to make sure they weren't stealing gold. Women couldn't be checked. Priests were above being checked, and the images were made out of solid gold. So they couldn't be checked. It wasn't until the mine closed in 1985 that an image of Santa Barbara, St. Barbara, uh, was brought in. St. Barbara is the patron saint of the miners. She now protects the mine. Garamperos, or prospectors, have a long and proud tradition in the state of Minas Gerais. After all, it was they who discovered the gold and have since discovered the other precious metals and minerals in the region. They're an independent lot, and their proud tradition continues today. Oro Prieto lies along an ancient route known as the Royal Diamond Road. The veins of gold have been exhausted, but more recently, pegmatites have been found. Those are pockets of gems and minerals. The mining center of the nation of Brazil is in the state of Minas Gerais, General Mines. From the capital, Belo Horizonte, we go northeast. In all directions, there are mines producing some of the finest gems, gemstones, and minerals in the world. City called Teofilo Otoni in northeastern Minas Gerais. And to this plaza come a number of miners with their raw and some of their, their more finished uh, precious stones. And it's very well known throughout Minas as a place you come and you'll find in the plaza people selling. It's the local permanent gem and mineral show. Tourmaline. Tourmaline. So he's got his bag. Pink tourmaline. Pink tourmalines. These are very, very pretty. The colors of tourmalines have a considerable variety. He's already cut. Uh, oh, here, look. Here's another display. This is a, this is a, a big one. So this, I know this is rose quartz. What's this? Amazonite. Amazonite. Yes. Now, will they sell this stuff by the kilo? Yes. Or by the piece? By the kilo. Uh -huh. Okay, and what's this? That's aquamarine. That's aquamarine. These are amethysts. And these are garnets. Garnets. And this is called apatite. And it, it's a deep, rich blue. And this is, they call this emerald. Emerald. So this is the rock from which emeralds come? Yes. Is this azurite? Is this appetite? Okay, this is a larger piece of appetite. Oh. Black agate. It's black agate or onyx. It comes in a lens, that's interesting. And this is smoky, smoky, smoky quartz. quartz. Uh -huh. Well, we've seen good stuff so far. Let's find some more. <laughs> these are beautifully polished aquamarines. Now these are berlita. These are barrels, really gorgeously finished. 
Brilliantly cut amethysts. Here are tourmalines. Uh, here's, a, here's a large piece of uh, tourmaline. Uh, so these are all mined in the region and polished locally here in the, in the town. Yes. That's a bewildering variety. So, so far we've, we've seen more or less smaller uh, rocks and very carefully finished products. But up here, I'm told there's a really big one. Now oh, here it is. That's uh, a good one. That, that's a good one. Now this is actually emerald? Yes, it's a crystal, uh, emerald crystal in matrix of uh, feldspar and uh, quartz. And quartz, and the owner says it weighs uh, about 12 kilos. Uh, the whole rock weighs 60 kilos, about 125 pounds. Just the emerald portion of it weighs 12 kilos or about 26 pounds. It's pretty impressive. One region in the state of Minas Gerais, rich in pegmatites, lies around the city of Valadares, about 300,000 people. The employment generated by the extraction and working on the pegmatite products, the gems and minerals, has produced enough additional revenue to give a new air of prosperity to the city. The people who work on them often bring their products to Tucson's Gem and Mineral Show each year. Many of the smaller mines in the region are family owned. One example is the Vasconcelos family. Paulo Vasconcelos has owned a mine from which he's been extracting minerals for nearly half a century. <laughs> and my father started this business in uh, 1940 uh, in uh, Conselheiro Pena area. And then we moved to Governador Valadares in 1959, and uh, from that time until now, we still work in the same business. My father passed uh, five years ago. His name was uh, Constantino Vasconcelos, and uh, we used to mine some, sometimes, and we buy some, uh, some goods from uh, other friends and the neighbors in uh, other mines. Valadares today is a, a city with about 250,000 people. And um, we have about 2,000 people working with stones, you know, buyers and uh, about another two or 3,000 miners, but very poor people, you know. So uh, we don't have so much money too, but when we have any a little chance, we opened some uh, small mines and helping the miners to to, to to do the work you know, and trying to find something. Cathedral Quartz is well named for its obvious resemblance. Cyanite is apparently delicate but of unusual depth of color. The assemblages of various tourmalines in the matrix is almost unparalleled anywhere else in the world. Then there are mixtures that almost defy descriptions. This recent acquisition from a family mine is a citrine quartz cluster. It uh, weighs in at over 300 kilograms.
There's a wide variety of smoky quartz. Several of these cluster quartz, citrine cluster quartz, from the same region. The technology for removing them is based around extremely delicate movement. Uh, this is a, a lot of um, quartz, laser quartz. Uh, the miners discover about three months ago. This is from uh, Pedra Alta. How do the miners know when they're getting close to a, a cluster? Well, the miners and, and we never know. And that's, uh, we know the vein, you know, the white spot with the feldspar, mica and barrels, and black tourmalines. Uh, this is the best chance to find the pockets, you know, and, the, and to stay in the pegmatite. Now, when they find a specimen like this, how do they go about extracting it, pulling it out of the mine? When we find a piece like this, sometimes we spend uh, one or two days to, to take it out from the mud, you know, and uh, to be loose, to, I mean, to don't break it. Yeah. But anyway, you know, sometimes we, we unlock because that's, you know, some facet damage, you know. But we take care as much as possible to so don't have any, any risk, you know. So this would take them probably two days just right. to loosen right. that and move it out? Right. This is seven tons, uh, the four tables. We spent yeah. about two months just to collect it from the pocket. So this is, but this is all from this is all one, one mine? One pocket, yes. It's one pocket, yeah. one pegmatite. Right, this four tables. Minha família, os meus avós maternos, e eles vieram de, da região lá de, de Portugal para Ouro Preto. De Ouro Preto eles desceram o, a, a margem do Rio Doce e viemos morar no Vale do Rio Doce. E naquela época existia uma jazida de ouro muito grande que funcionava e, e os funcionários eram ocupados pelos presos políticos que vinham de Portugal. E daí o meu pai começou a trabalhar com as pedras. Depois do ouro, ele passou a trabalhar com as pedras. E assim ele trabalhou durante 50, 60 anos em Governador Valadares, onde nós constituímos a empresa Vasconcelos Pedras. São os três filhos é, do Constantino. A Minas Gerais é um estado altamente produtor de diversos tipos de minerais. Nós podemos começar com a Alexandrita, que é uma, uma pedra raríssima. Nós temos uma produção imensa, próximo de Belo Horizonte. O minério de ferro que a companhia Vale do Rio Doce explora é, há mais de 40 anos. Esmeralda, que produz em, na cidade de Nova Era, também em Minas Gerais. E assim por diante. É um estado tremendamente produtor. Isso aqui foi descoberto pelos portugueses, pelos ingleses americanos, espanhóis, que na, na, naquela época que o Brasil foi descoberto, começaram a explorar o ouro, centenas de toneladas de ouro, naquela época é, da escravidão, foram parar em Portugal e de lá na, na Inglaterra. Nós estamos passeando hoje na, na Lava do Cruzeiro, é uma lava que fica localizada na... Minas Gerais, no município de São José da Safira, e é uma lavra muito antiga. Quando eu era criança, eu tenho 50, mais de 50 anos hoje, e eu já viajava aqui com meu pai comprando pedras. Naquela época era, era trabalhado aqui pelos ingleses e pelos americanos, depois da, da influência da Segunda Guerra, a necessidade de, de produzir mica que era um mineral muito precioso, que era usado nos, nos isolantes. E também era encontrado naquela época bastante turmalina e outras pedras que não tinha menor valor comercial. 
Então algumas eram encostadas e ficavam à margem, sem valor comercial para o mercado exterior. Hoje a turmalina é uma, é uma das pedras bem raras. Em relação ao diamante, é a quinta pedra mais rara. Então nós estamos fazendo esse investimento e tentando tirar alguma mercadoria para suprir a, o, o mercado e a procura. O pegmatito é um aglomerado de feldspato, mica, é, berilo e quartzo, cristal de quartzo. O pegmatito geralmente ele aflora, ele é, ele é entre uma rocha de guinais e uma outra rocha amorfa, ele aparece a linha do pegmatito no meio. Então, onde que nós vamos explorar? Quando a rocha é muito dura, nós temos que usar é, compressor de ar, furar e, o, e blaster. Quando a rocha é macia, usa-se apenas picaretas e, e trabalho humano. No processo da mineração, a gente é, procura seguir o veio. É, você está lá dentro da terra, você encontra como se fosse uma árvore. Tem um tronco, esse tronco é composto de feldspato, mica, albita e berilo. E junto com eles aparecem os caldeirões, que nós chamamos de pockets, né? de, de caldeirões mesmo. Depois dos caldeirões, tem veias finas, muito finas, que elas ramificam para diversos lados. Aí é onde a gente tem que ter muita atenção para não perder a, a ponta do veio produtivo. A gente chama aqui de veio, né? É o veio positivo e negativo. O negativo é o canto ali, que é o... A gente aqui chama de lápis. E o veio está no meio, é onde a gente minera. Ali tem o positivo aqui lá, ó. que é o que é branco lá. Não. A gente chama de básica o rei positivo e aquele rei lá. Aí onde tem aqui as pedras preta, a mica a rosa e o colinho. Aí é o rei positivo mineral. Essa base de 80, 80 metros mais ou menos. De profundidade. Aqui nós entramos na mesa tem 86 metros. Descendo. Atualmente nós estamos tirando um cascalho, que é uma turmalina de, ainda de baixa qualidade, porque nós, essa jazida ficou parada há muitos anos, cerca de 10 anos, e então nós estamos montando uma estrutura para lavar. Estamos encontrando canudos de, de turmalina bicolor, verde e rosa. Rubelitas e também com marina verde, algumas com pequenos defeitos, mas serve para utilizar na fábrica de bijuterias e joias de mais baixa qualidade. Mas eu acredito que muito breve nós vamos encontrar um, um, um virgem, uma linha virgem, onde a gente vai tirar alguma coisa de bom valor. É um labirinto realmente. E precisa de muita prática, infelizmente, para pedras coradas, digo, turmalina, esmeralda, água marinha, morganitas, não existe ainda aparelho para detectar esses, esses minerais. É, como o Gaia. Gaia é o aparelho que usa para detectar urânio, minério de ferro. E até para o ouro já existe alguma aparelhagem assim. Mas para pedra preciosa e caldeirões e pegmatitos, Ainda não existe sucesso nenhum tecnológico para indicar onde que estão os maiores, os maiores caldeirões. Nós fizemos um sistema de caçambas. É, as caçambas vão até um cabo, até no fim do serviço. E lá são entre 8 a 10 caçambas. Cada uma carrega 200 quilos. E elas, elas são puxadas por um guincho elétrico por dois fatores. Um que a gente precisa de lavar todo o material que está sujo de barro para evitar de jogar.